All right, folks, it's a few minutes past two, so let's get started. This is Julie Simpson from MIT Sea Grant. Welcome to the Community Response to Flooding National Sea Grant Visioning Project second webinar. Um, just some quick housekeeping uh, with the webinar. If you have, everyone is muted by default when you join the meeting, you have the power to unmute yourself. Um, so if you have any questions or concerns, please uh, don't hesitate to speak up. I think we'll hold questions till the end of the presentations. Um, just to keep things a little bit organized and if you have questions that you want to ask right away you can um, click on chat and uh, you can either ha have a private chat with um, an individual person or group chat that goes out to the everyone on the meeting uh, this meeting is being recorded so we'll send out a link after the webinar is over we'll have um, both audio and slides for it so let's get started Uh, our objective with this network visioning, um, national visioning project is to develop strategies for Sea Grant to understand the challenges and develop solutions for flooding and stormwater management um, through a, a, a range of infrastructure, um, policy, and finance options. Uh, I'm not going to read all the details of this. You can look at it later, but our, our kind of multi-pronged um, set of objection, uh, objectives is to expand the understanding of the different solutions for flooding and stormwater management, to improve communications and outreach um, on the topic, to work towards developing more resilient coastal communities um, through uh, expansion of knowledge about the risks, um, diversification and growth of coastal economies, and taking advantage of tools such as the uh, community rating system of the National Flood Insurance Program. And we'd like to develop strategies for um, responses to flooding events using lessons learned from um, all the states in the network, all the programs. We are your project co-leads from, as I mentioned, MIT. I'm from MIT Sea Grant, um, Florida, Lake Champlain, Woods Hole, and Minnesota. And the way we're approaching this is uh, we started with a series of three webinars to kind of share and expand our knowledge base of work that's already ongoing in um, the Sea Grant network. The first one was two weeks ago. This, today is the second one, and we have one more on Monday, a week from today. We're going to have an in-person workshop on February 28th and March 1st in Miami, Florida. We hope you all can join us for that. Um, it'll be two full days and we will be able to uh, discuss current state of um, knowledge and capacity of the Sea Grant program and, and develop a vision for where we wanna go from here. And then based on the results of that meeting and the outcomes, um, the co-lead team will develop a vision guidance document for the national office completing um, being completed in August of 2018. So our first webinar, which was uh, two weeks ago, Monday, was focusing on education and outreach. And we had several presenters talking about um, uh, work that they are doing, ongoing work, what successes they've had, what um, challenges they still um, encounter. Today, our focus is on um, science and technological solutions or approaches to flooding issues. We're going to have five short presentations um, from New Jersey, Woods Hole, Mississippi, Alabama, North Carolina, and Hawaii Sea Grant. I'm not gonna go into the details of those because you're about to see them. And then webinar number three, which is a week from today, January 29th, also at 2 p.m. Eastern, will focus on engagement, convening, and building relationships. Um, and then following that, as I mentioned, there'll be the in-person workshop February 28th and March 1. Um, we will have a link so that you can register for the meeting. We also have a hotel rate, um, conference rate at a nearby hotel. But that expires, I believe, at the January 27th. So you want to um, secure your conference rate as soon as possible. And please register for the conference so we know how many people are going to be there. And um, if you have any particular needs around the conference, you know, food needs or accessibility or anything like that, please don't hesitate to contact one of us um, and let us know so we can figure out how to. Uh, work out whatever we need to do. Um, that is the introductory presentation. Um, now, first up is Michelle Hartman, who is going to talk about her project um, in green infrastructure. Michelle, I will turn it over to you. Okay. Um, so, hello and welcome. Um, I want to thank 
everyone for joining us today and a special thank you to the Community Response Resiliency Network Visioning Group and the co-leads for hosting the webinar. Um, I think the topic is great and I'm excited to hear what the other speakers have to say. Um, so my name is Michelle Hartman and I'm the Water Resources Extension Specialist um, with New Jersey Sea Grant. And for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm basically gonna go over our objectives um, in the water resources component of the New Jersey Sea Grant Program and discuss in more detail our Green Infrastructure Technical Assistance Program. Okay. I cannot advance my slides. It's telling me that you have control. Okay. Let's say that I have control. Okay, there we go. Um, so like many places across this, the country, New Jersey is becoming increasingly affected by sea level rise, coastal flooding. Okay. All right, well, I'll just keep going. Um, is becoming increasingly affected by sea level rise, coastal flooding, and stormwater flooding. So for the last 13 years, our organization has focused on stormwater and green infrastructure to help local communities mitigate the effects of localized flooding and improve the life and water quality across the state. Uh, we found this to be important because a lot of organizations within our state are focusing more along the coastline and the New Jersey beaches, and a few um, local groups are really focusing on the inland issues with um, localized flooding. So using green infrastructure as a method for stormwater management, our focus has been to de developing these two core reports to kickstart the conversation with municipalities about how to in integrate green infrastructure into their community and help solve their stormwater and water quality related issues. Um, so we've used two core reports by the names of the Impervious Cover Assessment and the Impervious Cover Reduction Action Plan. Uh, we refer to them in our office as the ICA and the RAP, uh, just because we're all fan of acronyms in the Sea Grant world. Um, so the, they're the two primary tools we use and offer for planning support and green infrastructure to local municipalities. Together, the plans act as a me mechanism to build partnerships and inspire action. Uh, so both of these reports were developed as a lighter, quicker, cheaper way to understand the character of a watershed and develop an action plan for moving forward. The foundation of the plans is based on research done by Tom Schuler and Lisa Freely McNeil back in May of 2008. Based on their research, they developed a model that identified a link between water quality and impervious cover. And for those of you who don't know, impervious cover is any paved surface that does not let allow water to seep through it. Um, and their results shown in the graph indicate that areas with over 10% of impervious cover lead to water bodies that are impacted, which means they begin to have issues um, ecologically with sustaining better water quality. Um, areas with 25 to 60% impervious, co impervious cover are full on non-supporting, leaving limited resources to sustain ecological value in the water body. As a result of this research, we kind of short-circuited, sorry about that, we short-circuited the traditional watershed management planning process and isolated the core issue, which we identified as impervious cover. Um, so if you look at this slide, basically, um, what we've done is we've drastically cut down on the cost and the time associated with developing these plans. Um, this has increased our ability to partner with municipalities quickly and move directly into action. In the past, we've worked with different organizations and municipalities to develop the watershed management plans. Um, however, they took anywhere from two to three, sometimes four years to complete, um, as opposed to the two to three months of the ICA and the RAP. And as you can see in this slide, basically they, uh, they achieve almost the same results. Um, the ICA and the RAP do not, are probably a little less comprehensive in terms of water quality sampling and results, but they um, are an excellent mechanism to move directly into action 
Um, they allow for engagement throughout the process. Uh, one of the things we ran into a lot when developing watershed management plans was there was a committee of local stakeholders that met throughout the process. And by the end of the process, they were um, tired and kind of they lost the steam that was ignited early on. So by developing the ICA and the RAP as a living document that can always be added to, it opens the door to inviting new um, organizations and partners into the process throughout its entirety. So what is in these plans? The impervious cover report is an initial understanding of the impervious cover condition at both the municipal and the watershed level. Unlike traditional watershed management plans, developing these reports at both the municipal and watershed scale allows us to partner with anywhere from municipal officials to local watershed groups and other local environmental advocacy groups for planning and implementation. It is proven effective when seeking out initial partnerships to move directly into action. So overall, these, plan these reports um, introduce the problem in the local municipality specific to their um, local condition and gives a background um, in a series of maps, figures, and tables. So what you see here is a sample of what is shown in the report. It is um, a map of land use, which we can translate then into um, an a estimate on impervious cover. And then on this slide, you can see kind of how we've quantified that. So you, have, you get a table, both from the municipal level and the watershed level. Um, that calculates the total area of each of those things, the total impervious cover, and then the percentage that can be associated with Tom Schuler's research. So the impervious cover reduction action plan is the complementary action piece to the initial impervious cover assessment. Um, in addition to revisiting the initial conditions, the impervious cover plan offers a number of site-specific recommendations to ignite action in the local community. Each site page offers initial concepts for implementation, as well as estimates for reduction values, potential research, uh, recharge, and estimated costs. So what you can see on this slide is basically um, what each page looks like. Um, and it offers the site, the location of the site, a brief description, some site photos, and then some calculations to initiate the process. And then this is the brief concept also included in the report. In addition to their use to municipal officials and planning organizations, these plans provide a wide range of projects that can be leveraged by a number of different organizations. In the past, we have worked with watershed organizations, but also boys and Girl Scout groups, local garden clubs, and municipal officials to implement some of the recommendations offered in these plans. Overall, the plans have proven to be effective because of their versatility. In addition to providing actionable implementation projects, they're often used to, as a conduit for larger scale planning funds or as mitigation plans to offset impacts from development. They also can be utilized as a foundation for stormwater utilities, watershed restoration plans, stormwater, stormwater mitigation plans, and other integrated water quality plans. However, despite their success, these plans alone are not the solution to the large stormwater problem across our state. Unfortunately, these plans only examine existing development that, is not, uh, that does not include existing stormwater management infrastructure. Therefore, properties with existing stormwater management facilities, despite their age or quality, are not examined for green infrastructure solutions. In addition, agricultural properties are not examined as part of this process. I think moving forward, that is something that we should look into. Um, we're just working now on ways to kind of streamline that process um, and make it easy for us to include those into the reports. So although it may not answer all the questions of development, these plans have proven to be useful to individual municipalities to jumpstart a move in the right direction. As extension, our first goal is always to educate the public. Using these tools, we have been able to begin the conversation on the issues of stormwater and help usher them into the future using green infrastructure as a first line of defense. Thank you. And from my understanding, if you have questions, um, you can hold them to the end or add them to the chat.
Great, thank you, Shannon. Um, sorry, <laughs> thank you, Michelle. Uh, does anybody have any questions right now? All right, let's um, move on to our next uh, presenter who is Shannon Jarbo from Woods Hole Sea Grant. All right, thanks, Julie. Hang on, let me get your <laughs> presentation. <laughs> there we go. And give you control. You should be able to run it now. Okay. Make it a slideshow. There we go. All right. So my name is Shannon Jarbo. I'm from Woods Hole Sea Grant. We are uh, located on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Uh, so my role is to provide floodplain management technical assistance and uh, all of our Sea Grant jobs are unique, but um, this one is, is unique in that uh, that is my full time job is all floodplain management technical assistance. First, I'm going to talk about the community rating system because that is my uh, primary duty. So I want to give a little background on the CRS so that folks who aren't familiar with it uh, know what I'm talking about. And then I'll go into uh, the technical assistance that I provide. Uh, so the community rating system or CRS is uh, part of the National Flood Insurance Program or NFIP. It offers NFIP discounts in exchange for actions that reduce flood risk that are taken within a town, either by the town or any municipality um, or by someone else within that community. Uh, it works in 5% increments, uh, up so you can get up to a 45% discount on flood insurance policies for the folks within your community. It helps alleviate increasing flood insurance costs that we're all experiencing because of uh, changes in flood maps for some of us and uh, changes in flood insurance rates uh, that Congress has implemented within the last several years. Uh, and it also incentivizes resilience and better floodplain management. So it is a tool to use to incentivize that improved flood resilience that we're all looking for. Uh, this is how it basically is set up. There are four categories. Um, these are just examples of activities that communities can do to earn credit in the system, uh, in the CRS. So they fall into these four overarching categories. Uh, and again, either any entity with land use jurisdiction. So here in New England, that's cities and towns and other parts of the country. Um, uh, counties can uh, participate in the CRS as well. So this is the basics of the CRS. Once you uh, participate in these activities, you get points. Every 500 points you earn, uh, you get an additional 5% discount in the CRS. So that's quick background on the CRS. Uh, then moving on to what my position is and what my role is. So an overview of the CRS and floodplain coordinator position. So my position is a joint Woods Hole Sea Grant and Barnstable County extension position. So Barnstable County is Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Uh, so it's a joint position. I primarily focus on the 15 towns within uh, or on, on Cape Cod uh, because I am a joint county position, but if there are communities that need assistance um, off of the Cape, then I can offer some assistance to those communities with my Sea Grant hat on. Uh, the position was created about two and a half years ago, so it's still a relatively new position. Um, in 2014, we got new flood insurance rate maps that put a lot more people into the floodplain, which meant that a lot more people that had federally backed mortgages were then required to carry flood insurance. Uh, we were also affected about the same time by the 2012 and 2014 NFIP congressional reforms that increased flood insurance rates for everyone. So we got a bit of a double whammy, which a lot of the East Coast got um, relating to flood insurance costs. So in response to that, the county and Sea Grant wanted to do something to help the towns uh, and help the residents of uh, Cape Cod be able to better afford their flood insurance and stay in their homes because they were starting to hear some issues of people losing their homes uh, because of the cost of flood insurance. So the position was created with some Sea Grant seed money and then uh, within the last year I was transitioned over into a joint position with Sea Grant and the county. Our mission uh, of this position is to get all of the interested towns into the community rating system and improve their ratings as much as possible. So that means get higher discounts, but do that through increasing the resilience of those communities as much as possible. 
uh, also assisting with floodplain management overall and improving resiliency overall. The status right now where we're at, so again, uh, the position was created about two and a half years ago. Uh, we have eight towns in the CRS now. Three applications are in progress. Uh, we have $285,000 in annual savings, and that goes to about 3,000 policyholders that receive those discounts. Okay, so the technical assistance. Uh, so I basically provide technical assistance between floodplain management and the CRS, uh, more on the CRS, but what I do with floodplain management, uh, I work with building officials a lot, helping them to interpret building codes that re relate to floodplains um, and working with elevation certificates. That's a big thing. Elevation certificates are required for any CRS communities and they're typically used to meet uh, floodplain requirements. Um, so most communities use those and they can be really challenging. Um, so help building officials with those, uh, help conservation and planning departments with floodplain bylaws. Um, whenever a community is looking at a new one, um, they will sometimes bring me in to take a look at it. Uh, help with municipal flood zone designations. So if there's a question of um, a permit and whether or not it's in the floodplain, um, I assist with that. Uh, and then I also get calls directly from residents and businesses with flood insurance questions or flood zone designation questions. Uh, what I provide relating to the CRS um, is primarily project management. Uh, so I remove the necessity for towns to use the CRS manual. I still want them to be familiar with the CRS and why I'm doing what I'm doing, uh, but the CRS is a really resource intensive program. So the point is to try to alleviate that resource drain on communities so that they can still participate in the CRS and they can do all the great things that they need to do for flood resiliency, but they don't don't have to get stuck in the bureaucratic paperwork that, that the CRS uh, involves. So it involves lots of meetings at town halls, lots of phone calls, and mostly lots and lots of emails, um, emailing people to remind them of things that they need to do, um, checking in on where they're at on certain projects, um, reminding them to send out mailings, things like that. Um, I do a lot of GIS, uh, especially here in New England where we have small communities with limited capacity. Um, that's a big, a big piece of it. It's a big piece of the CRS. And because the towns don't have access to GIS, it's, it's a really critical thing to be able to provide that GIS uh, technical assistance to those communities. Uh, do some outreach and edu education, so creating new projects such as brochures. We did a high watermark sign uh, project a couple of years ago, uh, PowerPoints for local cable stations, things like that. And I also work with others uh, in the community, so real estate, banking, insurance, emergency management, nonprofits, uh, to help spread the word and to let them know what they can do to contribute to earning CRS credit. Because again, it's not just the community that has to take actions, it can be others as well. Uh, I also participate in two CRS user groups. I know there are other Sea Grant folks out there who do CRS user groups. Um, I run the Cape Cod CRS user group and I participate in the South Shore one, which is just a bit off Cape. Um, and then I also help with inquiries from off Cape, so helping to review their CRS programs or help them uh, with thinking through this similar kind of approach to uh, this regional approach to managing the CRS program. Some challenges that we have, um, what to do when all of the towns are in the CRS, how do we encourage them to continue to improve? Uh, that's something that we haven't run into yet, but uh, we do anticipate that we will. Um, wondering how to work with uninterested or overwhelmed towns and staff. We do have some towns and staff that just have, staff that have too many hats and towns that have too many other projects that they're trying to do. Uh, so still working through that. And how to address uh, some CRS prerequisites that are dealt with at a state level. That's, that's causing some potential challenges for us and there's nothing we can do it, about it at the local level. So working with the state on that is something that we still have yet to figure out. Um, what's next? Moving forward, uh, we're hoping to get the remaining seven Cape Cod towns into the CRS program. And then we want to improve the scores of the communities that were already in the CRS program when this position started. Uh, and then we want to continue developing relationships and agreements with off Cape towns to provide uh, some limited technical assistance. I, I wouldn't be able to fully manage the CRS for too many more communities, but um, I could certainly provide some limited technical assistance for those off Cape communities. Uh, and then overall, 
we want to see uh, an improvement in flood resilience and improvement in flood safety overall. So that is it. Um, I think we might have a, a time for just a quick question if anyone has it now. If not, we can just put them all off until the end. As a reminder, anybody who wants to ask a question can unmute yourselves. You have the power. <laughs> So one, I have a quick question. This all sounds great, Shannon. Um, you said the uh, one challenge is ongoing improvement, even once you get everybody in. Have you, do you use much the no adverse impact uh, document? Um, not at this point. Uh, that's something that we, we could do more of. Um, I'm certainly familiar with it, but um, it hasn't gained a lot of traction out here yet. Okay. Question though. All right, Renee, you should have control over the screen. Next up, Renee uh, Kalini from Mississippi, Alabama, as you can see. And Renee, we can't hear you. You may need to unmute yourself. Uh, Julie, I know Renee was having some uh, technical challenges before. Hi, can y'all hear me? Oh, there she is. All right. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I just didn't have a way to unmute myself. <laughs> um, did you take back control of the screen? Yeah, sorry. I just did that to um, unmute you, but you should have control again now. Okay, thanks. <laughs> sorry, everybody. Um, so yeah, I am Renee Colini, and I'm with the Northern Gulf of Mexico Sentinel Site Cooperative, and my Sea Grant home is Mississippi, Alabama Sea Grant. And uh, thanks for being here and for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, just to quickly tell you a little bit about our team. So there's a lot of people at Mississippi, Alabama Sea Grant working on providing technical assistance around flooding. Um, there's myself, and then some other people who are working on that include Christine Alexander, Hank Hoddy, Eric Sparks, Tracy Sempier, and Jody Thompson. And you can see that all of us have sort of dual appointments because we are a, a consortium. So we've got a pretty good spread across both of the states with people working on different aspects of flooding technical support. Uh, we have a lot of things going on. I'm just gonna quickly touch on some of them before I get into the, the meat of what we're talking about today. And we use the Coastal Resilience Index, and we've gotten a couple of the regional Coastal Resilience Grants, which have been used to provide case study videos and to develop gap analyses of where technical support is lacking. A lot of that has also generated small grants to provide support directly to the communities. We have the Gulf of Mexico Climate and Outreach Community of Practice, which helps bring people together, uh, and a lot of exchange of different ideas, as well as um, technical support can be found there. From that, we actually got a National Academies of Science Capacity Building uh, Grant, and so there's a couple different efforts affiliated with that, but all of them around flooding, one's focused on living shorelines, one's focused on the built environment, and then another's focused on education and outreach. And then, of course, we have the Northern Gulf of Mexico Sentinel Site Cooperative, which is focused on translating and transitioning sea level rise science and information into application. Um, we also have a lot of CRS technical assistance, which you just heard a lot about from Shannon. Uh, we also had a hazard summit specifically focused on flooding hazards as well as some wind hazards. And we've got um, Hank Hoddy, who engages directly with floodplain managers on these updated floodplain maps, which is much what you heard about as well. And then we've got some um, Eric Sparks, who's working on property owner focused living shoreline workshops and he was pretty excited about those. There are several examples of individuals who came to that workshop and decided to forego putting in bulkheads, which was nice to hear, as well as um, a living shoreline permitting guide and then there's gulftree.org, which 
just helps people sift through available climate change tools in a sort of structured fashion. So today, though, I'm going to zoom in on um, sort of our focus, and I was asked to speak specifically about uh, sea level rise scenarios two pager we're developing, and then sticking with the theme of two pagers. If I have time, there's one other one I wanted to show you around the updates to the floodplain maps. So the as you can see on the left, there was a global and regional sea level rise climate scenario to the United States technical report that was released. And this report has a lot of good information in it. Uh, it updates the scenarios. It got to those regional scenarios. And with the regional, it's one degree by one degree grid, so latitude and longitude, which when you start to thinking about it, is a lot of individual sea level rise scenarios to capture and describe. It's part of the fourth national climate assessment. And in addition to the scenarios, there's a lot of other good information in there. They show the um, increases at 10-year increments. They have probabilities included in there, as well as um, some information on expected increases in flood frequency under those different sea level rise scenarios and then some management and risk-based application guidance. The thing about this though, and that's why I have it up there at the top, is that it is a technical report. It's definitely not stakeholder uh, ready. And so the Sentinel site program has five cooperatives around the U.S. and we also have a lot of partnerships and, and open dialogue with some of the people that helped put this report together. And so we thought we could leverage the efforts we were already ongoing and develop a template for a two-pager that synthesizes sort of the meat of the information that a community might care about from these updated scenarios. And so what I'm going to show you is an example, and I've got it broken down into four sections, one per page, it's front and back. And so you're going to see the top of the front page, the bottom of the front page, the top of the back page, and the bottom of the back page. And so um, the text is not final, so don't hold any of that against me, but you can see here there's a short little introduction in terms of what we're going to be working on, um, what we're introducing in this web in, in this two pager. There's the actual graphic that has the scenarios specific for the community you're working on, and then we pulled out a couple of facts and the idea is that when in the template you would just replace, you know, there it says intermediate scenarios predict an increase of 1.7 feet of sea level rise. So you would leave all of that the same, except for that one number, the 1.7. You adjust that for whatever your community is. And the idea was to aim for 2060 because it was a, a nice, um, like productive range, a range that people were interested. It wasn't too far in the future. And so that was sort of where we focused. The bottom half is focused on future flooding and um, the colors are not uh, set in stone by any means. <laughs> We are going to bring in a graphic designer once we've gotten the content um, where we want it. And so essentially though, there's some text there that talks about this concept that is this, as the seas rise, you have more frequent flooding. And then there's this graphic that shows days of flooding on one side and then time across the bottom. And then each of those different colors reflect a different seal bar scenario. And so with the template, that graphic is actually there is out of an appendix of all of those that have been done so far by Billy Sweet with the NOAA co-ops. So that'll be available for people to pull into their two pagers. On the back, we have our frequently asked questions. So it's getting into, you know, how do you use these scenarios? Why are they different scenarios? And a little bit about the probabilities that are included in the report, because we often get those questions. Okay, here's this range. It's 0.3 to 2.5 meters. How do I even decide? And so they give some guidance on these probabilities. We actually include the probability table on the back of the two pager with a little bit of guidance on how you could use them as well as some additional sea level rise resources. So that's what the two pager itself looks like at the moment. Like I said, it will be um, dressed up by a graphic designer once we're at that point. The other accompanying document that's gonna go with this is essentially guidance. And it's pretty detailed. It talks you through exactly where you need to change things throughout the template, how you find those data. It's in a pretty large Excel spreadsheet and it can get a little overwhelming if you're not familiar with the layout of, of those data. And so we just walk people through it. And then there's also information about how to generate the graphs and input those. And the idea is that anyone can use these. It's not just for the Sentinel Site Cooperatives, it's for any extension agent or um, outreach professional. And the other thing that we did is to make this a little easier for people when they were trying to determine even which 
site which area they want to uh, use sea level rise scenarios for, because you can see each of those black dots is a location where they have regional scenarios. And so we have an appendix that has those all visually laid out so you can just quickly go and say, okay, there's my community, there's the closest you know, station to me, whether it's a, a, a gridded one or an actual tide station. And I think I have a couple minutes. Um, I just wanted to say, we've actually gotten pretty happy with the language and so we'd like to broaden that scope um, of people who are involved in editing it and reviewing it and making comments. So if you have any interest in helping shape this two-pager, please shoot me an email. Um, we are always looking for more perspectives and, and um, additional help on these things. So uh, with the little bit of time I have left, I just want to quickly talk about the other two-pager. Here you can see an excerpt from it. Um, it was generated essentially to help the communities in coastal Alabama understand what this means for them as the new floodplain maps are coming out. And you just heard a lot about that from Shannon. And so essentially on here, it's a quick two sheet and it's got information on the policies that exist, the losses that have occurred, the payouts that have happened, important dates around these floodplain maps. So when, the re when they're gonna be released, how long you have for any sort of um, appeal, that kind of information. And then in addition to what you see here with the increases and decreases in net change across the two counties. You also have some key takeaways on the back in terms of what this information means. And so with that, I will stop here um, and take any questions. And thanks again for listening, y'all. All right, thank you, Renee. We do have time for a question or two while I'm switching over to the next presentation. Renee, this is Thomas Hooper with Florida Sea Grant. Um, it sounds like some great work. I like your two pagers. I'm curious if you've spoken at all with NOAA and Climate Central as they had been collaborating, I know, on mining NOAA data as well to put together information sheets that were quickly customizable for, air, uh, I think, at the local government level, or at least at the county level, I know I had reviewed some. Uh, we have, we've been working with people from co-ops as well as the Office for Coastal Management. And um, I actually, yeah, did advise some on the Climate Central work as well. And the idea is that this would be just a quick, easy way to communicate specifically those scenarios. Um, whereas I think the Climate Central stuff goes a bit farther into assessing what those scenarios might mean for your community. Okay. Oh, and on the Smart Home America on the back page where you give some data there, I noticed it's in square meters. Probably, I mean, I wouldn't recommend square meters for most people in this country. <laughs> I'll pass that along to Hank. This is thanks, Thomas. Room for yeah. another question? Yeah, one more question, Pam. Go ahead. Great. Pam Rubinoff, Rhode Island. Um, Thanks a lot for sharing that with us. We've been um, going through the similar thing as many others have been. Um, I'm curious as to, you noted about the 2060, and you thought that that was a good time. And we've been finding in our communities that uh, 2050 is even a push, but we you know, talk about the 30 year mortgage, um, of which many people are now doing 50 year, 15 year mortgages. But so I'm curious, that, that's just um, a curious number. Uh, that you that you uh, did for 2016. So I'd love to get some insight. And then um, I didn't see it, but maybe you had it uh, written in there. Of given all of those scenarios, do you give any advice on what to use for what? Not advice, but what what how you <laughs> might go about thinking about if they use this curve versus that curve? Yeah. So as for the 2060. Um, we felt like it was a good middle ground to, to um, it wasn't so far out of range as 2100, but there was still um, some good spread in the different scenarios because um, as you move forward, you know, there's a bigger spread in them. And so we were trying to get some different spacing out between like intermediate high versus higher versus low, uh, I think is sort of where we came at that from. Um, but that's why we're broaden, you know, broadening the scope. So I hope that you uh, join the team. <laughs> and then as for guidance or some 
um, suggestions on what kind of curves to use for what that is in there. And it's actually based on guidance that was in the full report. And that's why we included those probabilities on the back. And we talk about it from a perspective of risk. So if you're building something that has a low risk tolerance and has a long-term plan, then you should probably consider the less, the, you know, the, the least, less likely high impact scenarios versus if it's something without a lot of investment or you don't expect to be around for very long, maybe you can plan for some of the more certain, um, less impactful scenarios. Great, thanks. I'll have to look at that a little closer. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, Renee. Jess Whitehead is up next. Jess, you wanna take control? Let's see here. Hello everyone, I'm Jess Whitehead. I'm with North Carolina Sea Grant and um, I'm going to also throw a shout out to my co-author Lisa Shivanato who may actually already be off the call. Our apologies, we had to also schedule our uh, weather and climate visioning call for later this afternoon. So Lisa's gonna hop over and take that. Um, as well as Holly White, who's the planner for the town of Nags Head. Uh, we have several, um, communities in which we're engaging. I decided to just share one of those with you today since it's only 10 minutes. Um, and an example of how we have most recently adapted the VCAPS process, vulnerability consequences and adaptation planning scenarios in the town of Nags Head. Um, just to orient you all to the place, uh, it's a barrier island on North Carolina's Outer Banks, about 11 miles long, has both oceanfront and estuarine shoreline. That sound front shoreline, I should note for those of y'all who are not familiar with our coast, is actually primarily wind-driven tide, not lunar tide. So two very different processes in a very narrow strip of land. Um, your older, uh, just a couple of examples of what some of the development looks like, both on oceanfront and sound sides. Um, the town was incorporated in 1961. Its flood maps were put into place in the 1970s, so some of this older construction certainly would not be permitted today. Um, we began this process with them back in 2015. The concept here was that the town of Nags said knew that they were vulnerable. They have a history of vulnerability, whether it was the Ash Wednesday storm of 1962 to the chronic erosion in the 80s to understanding that sea level rise and climate change are happening and the North Carolina legislature is not actively making its own plans at this point, uh, they wanted to know where to get started. And so we very successfully have used VCAPs in the past in cases where a community is really starting from ground zero in terms of how to begin scoping an adaptation plan. So this particular project um, stemmed out of a twofold vision of true co-production co here. Uh, this means that um, the town of Nags Head has been completely involved with us in this as a partner side by side from the time we started with the beginning of the project. Obviously this doesn't happen all the time, but when it does happen, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, the two goals really were to mainstream sea level rise and climate change into the Nags Head comprehensive plan, the focus Nags Head plan. Um, and then to enable some long-term budgetary measures that would ensure sea level rise and incorporate it into town planning for decades to come. Uh, generally, the work plan here, um, as you see, there are on a very narrow strip of land, there are multiple decision makers that we have to deal with. Unfortunately, in this case, we basically had the town of Nags Head and the homeowners at the table. Dare County, uh, State of North Carolina, and the Park Service were not participants here. So obviously you're already looking at a situation where your adaptation plan is going to be somewhat constrained versus what needs to actually be done to completely look at comprehensive adaptation in place. So we picked off um, looking at what was vulnerable to sea level rise and the scientific information needed to enable decisions to explore some adaptation practices that would improve resiliency and to begin to move them toward a risk-based planning approach. Um, initially, this began in 2015 and was confined to sea level rise. Hurricane Matthew in 2016 changed that. Uh, Matthew hit um, 
basically brushed North Carolina. We had tremendous inland flooding, uh, almost as bad as Hurricane Floyd in 1999, and basically the rest of the country outside of North Carolina has forgotten it already happened. Uh, but Town of Nags Head's flooding was not from ocean overwash, not from storm surge, either from the sound side or the ocean side. It was all from rainfall. And the combination of an ocean side uh, gravity fed stormwater outfall system that was covered up just long enough to keep basins in the town of Nags Head that incidentally are not mapped as floodplain properties um, underwater for several days. So uh, VCAPS, for those of you who don't know it, is a three-phase process that is basically doing some interviews in the community and then a series of group diagramming meetings. That's used to generate um, user-generated series of public and private adaptation actions that can be considered and provides this to you in a real-time diagramming format. The Town of Nags had asked us to adapt this process uh, and have it as a completely open public meeting. Uh, as you know, sea level rise has been somewhat controversial in the state of North Carolina, and the town felt it was incredibly important here to head any controversy off at the pass. So keeping the public involved uh, from step one was very important to them. Um, now, a note, I do know Julie asked, and you know, some cases what makes, um, I'm gonna skip that particular slide here, you know, what are some cases where this has not been as effective? This is something that in uh, terms of VCAPs, we're currently trying to evaluate this. Uh, Seth Tuller and Kirsten Dow are currently working on this um, to look at why some VCAPs cases have been successful and some have not. Um, I, I think in some ways we're, we're still looking at that, but it probably depends on how implementable your actions are. In this case, we got 160 some odd actions and went through a prioritization exercise with some very doable steps. In other places, um, just to the southwest in Hyde County, North Carolina, um, some of the steps there, for instance, CRS seems like it should be very simple until you're talking about a, an extremely low capacity county with um, people who don't have a lot of technological capabilities who also have two other full-time jobs and the county beginning to weigh those suggested actions versus the number of policies that they actually have even in place in the county. And so that perhaps has not been as um, implementable a case as we have in the town of Nags Head. Um, so just to give you a sense of, uh, we had three separate breakout groups and then the Nags Head Board of Commissioners established a climate change and sea level rise subcommittee that then worked with us and town staff to pull these three breakout groups uh, individual diagrams into two subject area synthesis diagrams. This is the one on ocean and uh, estuary and shoreline management. Just to give you an example of the amount of information that you have basically based on between the three breakout groups, about six contact hours. Um, a zoom in on the um, septic water, wastewater, um, stormwater and drinking water di focus diagram here just to give you an example of what one of these looks like that's a little bit more legible. This one is one where we're probably ahead of the science in terms of being able to think of the combined sea level rise and precipitation impact on septic system failure. However, that's a very important waste, um, not only a wastewater but a stormwater management issue in the town. They are 85% on septic. Uh, so still here we were able to get some potential no regrets type adaptation actions um, incentivizing septic system maintenance for instance that are implementable and can be used by the town uh, overall the target areas going forward here are ocean shoreline management estuarine shoreline management the stormwater management and then the combined issues of ground and surface water management um, and that was, um, we had a couple of meetings afterward to take those 160 actions and have everyone in the committee work to prioritize those down and combine duplicative actions. Uh, the VCAPS report was passed, uh, accepted by the NAGSED Board of Commissioners in 2017. The sea level rise section of the NAGSED Comprehensive Plan was included as part of the plan that was passed in August 2017. 
So these are things that we um, did in progress, um, basically in concert moving together. Um, where are we going from here? Looking at updating the local science guidance. Um, we're also looking at the NOAA report as well as some other reports coming out of Bob Cop shop at Rutgers um, to try to provide some additional guidance to the town. Uh, how to look at precipitation and stormwater is another issue where I think we really are ahead of the state of this, uh, the science of combining what you can reasonably do with the downscale precip scenario versus what you need to do from a civil engineering standpoint. And we're focusing on trying to mainstream these guidance into the funded plan updates. They have a um, comprehensive oceanfront and estuarine shoreline management plan, a stormwater master plan, and an on-site wastewater management plan that are all due for an update. The RFPs for all three of those will, uh, will require sea level rise and climate change to be considered by the consultant. So key lessons learned here. Uh, number one, making sure that you try to adapt your process for needs that emerge as you go along. Um, the stormwater issue is something that has really come through. This has been a long-term engagement um, with the town since Hurricane Matthew. Additionally, we're dealing with the exact opposite problem that you have in Massachusetts. As we remap properties, we have properties that are coming out of the floodplain in North Carolina. And so how do you maintain what we know is resilience to hurricanes when those properties are being mapped out of uh, the property owners being told that they must have flood insurance. And then again, what do you do when you're ahead of the science? Um, so keys, our keys to success here, uh, we've had extremely supportive Nags Head Board of Commissioners as well as the town staff. And the key on our side, I think, has really been to meet them with where they are and speak their language, not force them to speak ours. So uh, the, the point, Thomas, that you made about not using square meters. Uh, th that's one of the things that we have to make sure we don't do. Uh, the one-on-one -on -one interviews helped a lot in terms of being able to have the community trust having folks come in from Raleigh. Not all good things come from Raleigh when you're on the coast. Um, in fact, some people on the coast would argue that nothing good comes from Raleigh. So we had to uh, work against that particular perception. We engaged those who were opposed directly. Uh, we had folks who had been involved in the passage of the North Carolina Sea Level Rise Bill who were at the VCAPS workshop and actively involved in contributing. The focus on no regrets actions did a lot to diffuse any kind of controversy over the science. And then finally, allowing them to prioritize what those action steps are and develop the steps going forward from there has been pretty key to actually getting them to uh, commit to actions. So uh, with that, there's our contact information. Take any questions. All right, thanks, Jessica. Um, I think we might uh, move on if nobody has any burning questions or if you have questions, you might chat with them uh, or put them in the chat. So next up is um, we're gonna shift over to the Pacific Ocean and hear from Brad Ramin of Hawaii Sea Grant. Brad, you should be able to um, take control of the presentation. Brad, if, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Oh. Um, there you go. <laughs> now we can hear you. You got me okay? Can you hear yep, me? Go, go ahead, Brad. We can hear you now. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. All right. Yeah, again, this is Brad Romine. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you all, and thanks for all the presenters so far. Um, I want to take this chance to talk a little bit about um, the work I'm doing with the state of Hawaii, looking at a statewide perspective here at improving resilience to coastal hazards and sea level rise. Um, through extension in Hawaii. Um, like Shannon, I have a cost share position um, with the State of Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources, and um, that has been a um, successful model for Hawaii Sea Grant for almost 20 years now. We have uh, several agency-based extension faculty, and it's been a great route for us to um, get right in there with and work directly with the decision makers and another route into the communities. Um, 
in 2016, we, we formalized our, um, our framework for coastal climate science and resilience through the establishment of the new center um, with the goal of uh, providing science support uh, for coastal management and hazard resilience. Again, this is meant to be kind of an umbrella for um, our network of extension faculty. We have folks based in um, county planning agencies, uh, myself at uh, the state DLNR, and then uh, Dolan Eversoll, who's located with a special um, Waikiki Beach Management Association as well. Uh, association as well. Um, the goal of the center is really to um, better help connect our university researchers through our extension faculty and uh, with community stakeholders. And then we really are trying to promote transdisciplinary research, um, which really we're finding more and more is necessary to address a lot of these vexing problems around coastal hazards and particularly climate change and sea level rise. And then as a two-way bridge, we're also, um, this has also been a great way to help inform the university's uh, research agenda um, to meet local and regional needs. So I just wanted to share some examples of the work we're doing um, towards those goals. And the first has been um, my work and some of my coworkers' work on the uh, Hawaii Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Initiative. There was um, two important pieces of legislation, um, first in 2014 and 2017, um, where the state has really um, taken an effort to um, move towards uh, adaptation and uh, mitigation for climate change. And um, in 2017, um, Hawaii, with uh, its state Act 32, became the first state to enact legislation that implements portions of the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, this act also established a interagency Hawaii Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Commission that was meant to continue work um, from a committee that was formed in 2014 uh, the committee and now this commission are intended to provide policy direction, coordination, and planning across agencies um, at the states and counties. And the first directive of that act in, in 2014 was to complete a sea level rise vulnerability and adaptation report for, across the state. And um, Sea Grant, um, through my job and, and colleagues, we were involved um, early on, even before 2014, in helping to um, craft the technical details of of that state legislation at uh, the request of, of state government. And so we've recently completed um, this Hawaii Sea Level Rise Vulnerability and Adaptation Report. It was just delivered to um, the State Climate Commission um, at the end of the year. It's a technical report based on the best available climate science. Um, we're assessing vulnerabilities to coastal hazards with sea level rise, as well as providing broad scale recommendations at the state level for improving resilience to coastal hazards with climate change and sea level rise. And um, further, this report is intended to be a framework for assessing other climate impacts at the state. And, and my role, Sea Grant's role, is, again, has been to help um, with the scientific basis for this report and um, helping to coordinate the modeling and mapping for that project. So I just wanna show you a little bit about the science um, with the modeling and mapping we're doing around um, coastal flooding with sea level rise, but also looking at things like coastal erosion. So there was three primary models that were used um, for, for the report, um, the passive flooding, just your basic bathtub model. But we also wanted to take that a step further um, and working with researchers at the, here at the University of Hawaii School of Ocean Earth Science and Technology. So um, we work with Chip, Chip Fletcher and his team at the, in the geology department here at the university to develop some models for coastal erosion and high wave flooding along the coastline with sea level rise. And then working with the state DLNR and Tetra Tech, who is their, um, their consultant on that, we took those models and are combining them into a overall sea level rise exposure area. The thinking that being um, whichever hazard it is um, from a chronic basis, whether it, it is wave overwash, it's passive flooding or um, coastal erosion, these are areas that are prone to chronic flooding um, one way or another uh, in the future with sea level rise. And here's an example of um, just some maps. Um, these are available statewide, uh, but this is just one section of the North Shore on the island of Oahu, um, area called Waialua. Um, the top, the light blue, is that uh, combined sea level rise exposure area with one foot of sea level and then um, about three feet of sea level rise on the bottom. And then the state's consultant um, took that data and did a vulnerability assessment. Um, compiled uh, property level information from the counties, um, from census data to uh, calculate economic impacts um, to development on the shoreline. 
it was done at the property level scale, but then um, upscaled to these one hectare or two and a half acre grids. Um, and the colors represent the economic loss potential. In this case, this map, three feet of sea level rise, uh, some of those uh, darker orange grid cells are um, over $10 million within that grid of potential impact. There's probably a, a resort um, or something within that, that cell. And then, of course, the statistics were, were compiled um, statewide and then um, at the island basis and um, found that uh, $19 billion of uh, potential loss of land and structures um, with these feet of, three feet of sea level rise across the state and also looked at potential impacts to miles of road, number of residents potentially displaced um, with sea level rise, with flooding, erosion, wave overwash um, along the coastline. And then the report had broad scale recommendations and um, Sea Grant was closely involved in this and also um, leveraged and built on some previous work um, from Sea Grant. Uh, like this uh, document seen in the top right, sea level rise and coastal land use in Hawaii. Um, and we also hosted through the state and with a lot of support from Sea Grant, a couple of um, stakeholder meetings, over 200 invitees from cross section of, of stakeholders, community members to help us develop the vision for the recommendations and actually help come together with um, particular recommendations for the port um, around land use and community planning, things like smart redevelopment, flood risk management, natural resource conservation, cultural resources, water quality, um, and uh, some other categories for that within the report, broad scale recommendations. So that report is out now. Um, it's available on the state's climate um, website, climateadaptation.hawaii.gov. And I want to talk real quickly about some of the work we have now following on that report. Um, in 2016, we got a grant um, through the Regional Coastal Resilience Grants Program from NOAA. And um, we awarded this grant in partnership with the state of Hawaii through the Department of Land and North Natural Resources and our Office of Planning. And, um, with them, we came together with uh, three complementary projects to, to build on the work of the Hawaii Sea Level Rise Report. And these, this work is ongoing. Um, the project runs through April 2019, and we're also leveraging some other ongoing and recent projects and initiatives that are related. The first project um, that we've largely completed now was this Hawaii Sea Level Rise Viewer. And this is intended to be an interactive online atlas to go along with the Hawaii Sea Level Rise Report. Um, it's available at hawaiiseadoverriseviewer.org if you want to check that out. It's an interesting to tool. I wish I had time to demo it to you, but uh, provides this um, exposure areas, erosion projections, vulnerabilities. Some of those map layers that I showed you examples of are now um, available. You can zoom in, move around uh, the Hawaiian Islands to look at those impacts. But the overall goal with this was really to empower decision makers and communities to better un understand and plan for um, flooding and erosion um, with sea level rise. The second project we're doing now is really an attempt to try to downscale um, these, these broader recommendations and data that's coming out of the sea level rise report into the community plan level. And um, we have, we're working closely with um, county government on Kauai, Oahu, and Maui, and leveraging a couple other projects to um, learn with them how to downscale, how to utilize this sea level rise data and other um, past plans and work into the community planning process. And then the third project we're doing is building on some work that was done uh, Maui County um, with, with Sea Grant, looking at um, pre-planning for disaster recovery. How do we build back smarter um, following a coastal disaster, flooding, erosion, hurricane, or tsunami? Make sure we're building back smarter, using that as an opportunity um, potentially for adaptation for um, a really challenging problem of dealing with existing development. Uh, we have a lot of homes, roads, infrastructures that were just built too close to um, erosion and flood co co coast here in Hawaii. So how do we deal with that um, in a post-disaster scenario um, with, with planning before that? Um, so we build back smarter, uh, more resilient, and um, considering uh, potential impacts to environmental resources. So, um, we're continuing to work on that NOAA funded project. Um, there's some areas in particular I wanted to mention um, that might be you know, really helpful to continue discussions through this network um, where we could use help. We looked at the 100 year 1% coastal flood zones with sea level rise, with that state sea level rise report. And um, there was an extensive mapping effort to look at what the velocity zones at the coastline would look like with sea level rise. In the end, they were not included with the sea level rise report. Um, 
there was some concern about just um, too many assumptions on top of our chronic flooding maps we were making. Um, and there was also some concern or misunderstanding that we still need to work on with our um, state and county floodplain management folks on, on how to consider these um, low frequency, high impact coastal flood events with sea level rise in the future. Another topic that's getting a lot of discussion here in the state following on um, the report is managed retreat and managed re realignment. How do we move some of our existing development out of um, flood prone, erosion prone areas, areas that are already having problems, they're gonna have more problems in the future. Um, the third thing we really could um, use some help on is just uh, uh, working closely with uh, other folks um, across the US that are um, working on pre-disaster recovery planning. And um, that's something, again, we're trying to do through our NOAA Resilience Grant, but uh, I know there's a lot of examples um, from the Eastern Seaboard, the Gulf, Florida, et cetera, that dealing with recent storms. So we plan more outreach to, to reach out to folks like uh, that um, these communities are they're dealing with these impacts um, recently. So thank you with that, uh, for that. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to uh, share this work with you. And I think we'll take any questions at this time. Yes, thank you, Brad. We probably have time for one or two questions if anybody has any um, for Brad specifically or for any of the other presenters or um, comments. If no one has any questions uh, right now, there are a few that came in uh, over the chat that we could uh, have folks answer. Um, it looks like they were, they were mostly answered uh, by the presenters, but in case folks haven't seen those, um, hold on, I'm getting to it. <laughs> okay, uh, one question uh, that was for Michelle uh, was, uh, can you quickly summarize what is New Jersey's or your specific role in creating the ICA slash RAPs? Um, so what I mentioned in the chat for this is basically our role is to do everything having to do with the report from the initial site assessments to running the calculations and developing the initial concepts. Um, as part of kind of the methodology for creating those reports, we developed a series of Kind of what we call look here first sites, which are ways of identifying properties without um, existing stormwater management infrastructure to get hit the ground running and start looking and assessing properties at the ground level. And then part of the idea of it being a living document is that once it's initially presented to some organization involved in the community, they can also help by contributing sites to assess and add to the report. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, Michelle, I think, I think that this was for you as well. Um, and you may have just covered it a bit, but if you want to add anything, have you tested this with planners or local government folks? So, um, yes, we have tested with planning and government folks. Typically what we do, um, part of the process is to obviously create the reports and then, um, present them in some capacity to the municipality of which they were created for. So each report is created on a municipal or watershed scale, which means that there's a report for a municipality um, that's spe site specific to their town or neighborhood. Um, and then we typically go in to the community if we have an existing partnership with either the uh, a local organization or an environmental commission, we will present to them initially, but the goal is to get into the offices of the municipal officials to begin the conversation of how we integrate this into their structure, their city structure, their town structure. Okay, great. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, and I'm now realizing that, that with that timing, that question I think may have been for Renee. So if Renee, if you can join us again uh, and answer if you've tested uh, with planners or local government folks? The two pager on the field arise scenarios, I we've not gotten right. there yet. Okay. Okay. Um, we hope to do that. Um, 
once we've had the graphic designer look at it. But that is part of why we're doing this sort of intermediate step before the graphic designer will bringing in um, more extension agents and, and additional people who spend a lot of time working directly with the communities. Okay, great. Uh, another question for you, Renee. Um, how have you or do you plan to explain the difference between FEMA mapping information and the sea level rise information that you're generating? So the scenarios that we're talking about are just general increases in mean sea level. And to me, I think as long as we make it clear that we're not directly correlating that to changes in floodplain maps, that they're not going to increase by X amount equivalent to what the sea level rise increases, um, that research has to be done to do that, which we have ongoing. Um, I think we'll be okay. But mm -hmm. it is definitely a, a concern on how we message around all the different information coming from the different agencies. And that's part of what the cooperatives help do is bring together the different agencies, at least on a local level. Okay, great. Uh, and there was a request for your email in the chat. So if you if you want to share that, um, actually, can you access the chat right now? Yep. Okay. So if you could, there you go. Add that. Thank you. Um, we have another question uh, that was for Jess. Jess did answer it in, in the chat, but Jess will give you a chance to answer it to everyone. Uh, the question is, how accessible have your participants found the VCAPS diagram process? Do they respond to it relatively intuitively or do you need to do a lot of explanation and handholding? Yeah, so usually there's about a 10 minute presentation and the, the, the there's been 19 of these cases so far. I think I've personally facilitated about 10 of them. And it seems like, I keep saying I need to start getting a clicker out. Somewhere between 30 and, the, they're a little bit slow to start. You have to prod them a little bit. Somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes, it starts to click for people. And then the facilitator has the exact opposite problem because you're trying to then slow the group down so that your person who's capturing it on a diagram can actually do it. I, they just start rapid fire throwing things at you so fast. Uh, the more interesting question, I think, is, and something that we're trying to evaluate is, what's the role of the diagrams afterward? Because somebody will go back, you know, six months, a year afterward, and if they're not somebody who is a particularly visual thinker, the main value of the diagram itself was it makes the report really easy to write because you can say this happens, then this happens, then this happens, so you should think about doing this. Um, or we think we should think about doing this. Um, some people have gone back and the diagrams have not been that useful. Um, whereas Holly White, our planner with Town of Nags Head, plotted ours out on one of the, using the town plotter and keeps them up on the wall in her office. So. All right, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from folks for any of the speakers at this point? All right, hearing none. Uh, folks are available by email. Uh, the co-leads, we can help answer questions as well or, or direct you to anyone if you have further questions. Uh, Julie, is there anything else that we want to cover? Um, I think we're set for now. Can you guys hear me now? There was something wrong with my microphone before. <laughs> yes, can hear you now. <laughs> Thank you for stepping in, Shannon. You got um, it. <laughs> uh, I think we're covered. Um, I hope that everyone will join us next Monday at the same time, 2 p.m. Eastern, for our third and final webinar um, on uh, engagement and um, convening. And then uh, also please join us in Miami at the end of February, beginning of March for our in-person meeting. It would be great if we could have um, the input of lots of people as we try and develop the vision for Sea Grant for the next few decades. Um, thank you all very much. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact any of us. Um, and we'll hopefully see you next week. <laughs>